easiest trip to Santa Cruz ever. So I, I you know, th there are upsides to the pandemic. Yep. Okay, so I think we can go ahead and get started. So hi, everyone. Welcome to tonight's webinar. Um, so our presenter today has a really fun webinar from what I can tell in the camera. Um, but before we start, I do want to kindly ask that participants mute themselves. If you have a question, feel free to unmute yourself and just ask it out loud because we have a, a pretty small group here today. Um, if not, you can always use the chat and I'll be helping our presenter monitor that. But I'll hand it over. So hi, I'm Zeke Kossover. I was a high school physics and environmental science teacher for 21 years before dying and going to teacher heaven. And now I work at the Exploratorium, um, which as I'm sure all of you all know is a science museum in San Francisco. Although since we've been closed for almost a year now, I'm not entirely sure we count as a science museum anymore, but uh, someday we hope to reopen and become a place where people can go visit. We, uh, the Exploratorium publish, has published more than 250 activities online and we call them snacks. They are small activities um, and they're all 100% free, your tax dollars at work. Um, and so I'm gonna show you a few of them tonight. If you have some materials with me, with you, you can uh, play along. Um, the announcement suggested you bring a few. Did anyone bring any uh, any materials with them? Melissa did, yay. Okay, great, great, great. So I'm glad you all had a chance um, and I have enough to, we can play together and I have some other ones we can add on um, if it's too boring watching me do stuff. So uh, the Exploratorium uh, is very focused on the idea that students and our visitors should experience the phenomenon as directly as possible. And so we try to do all of our activities where students and uh, adults have the opportunity to interact as much as they can with the experience. And if that can't be done, then we try not to do that. So you'll find our chemistry section of our activities full of chemicals and things to mix together and very little bit about nuclear physics. Nuclear physics is interesting, but there isn't very much hands-on you can do with it. So outside of uh, some Rutherford scattering, there isn't much else there about nuclear physics because we really want to focus our time on the things where people can see and touch them. So for example, I'm gonna put over to my camera here, I'm gonna spotlight it. and turn on some better lights. And perhaps you can see there are a couple of bowls here and some pennies. This is a newish penny. And then these other pennies are all old and dingy. Can you tell the difference between these two maybe? Yep. All right, great. And so what we're gonna do is, is I've got a series of liquids here and we're gonna put the pennies in those liquids and see what happens with them. If you have your own condiment and some dirty pennies, you can drop them in too and see what happens. So we'll do this first. Well, then we'll go on to something else because it'll take it a few minutes for our chemistry to happen. And then we'll come back and look at it. So. This very first one here is plain water. The second one is vinegar. And by the way, I've lived in the Bay Area long enough now that all of my neighbors think everything can be cleaned with vinegar, that nothing else is as healthy or as safe as vinegar. And we should use that to clean everything. And I just wanna say, that's not true. Just, I'm just going to go on with that right now. Just put that out there. Vinegar is super useful. It doesn't fix all things, but it might fix pennies. This next one is vinegar and salt. And the last one, my color rendition is not as good as I would like, but does anyone have any guesses as to what that final one is? Ketchup. It's ketchup. Y'all are correct. Ketchup. 
So we're going to put the penny in the ketchup. And uh, Melissa, did you bring a uh, condiment to, to throw a penny in? Oh, uh, well, yeah, I have taco sauce, sriracha, mustard. You know. What do you think? As many, well, perhaps we should let other people have their guess about what you should do. Mayo. Oh, mayo. So you might be wondering, what wine is fantastic? <laughs> we don't get that as much with our, well, sometimes we do get that with our students, but we'll just like, like quickly move over that. <laughs> um, whatever, whatever you want, sriracha sounds great if you have that. Okay, I'm gonna go get a little dish. So you might be wondering what the purpose of this activity is. So there's um, a chemical reaction that will happen. We'll be able to make some, get some ideas about this reaction. And I've used the, we, we've done this activity in class quite a lot because it's a kind of an interesting um, result. But when we were deciding to do this activity online, my colleague Desiree Whitmore and I, we were trying to figure out what students could use at home. And we realized that we couldn't count on students having any particular chemicals at home. They might have vinegar, they might not have vinegar, they might have ketchup, they might have soy sauce. We didn't know what they would have at home. And by the way, the NSTA says, and I hope you all are all wearing your safety goggles because NSTA says you should not allow your students to use vinegar without safety goggles. I'm not making this story up. So, yeah. Yeah, the, the, some people had some little negative looks. You should have negative looks from that. Um, because I rarely do when I make my, uh, you know, when I make salad dressing, I almost never put on safety <laughs> goggles first. I mean, there was this one time, but that was because it was habanero sauce. And, you know, you know, you gotta be careful with that stuff. Um, anyway, we suddenly realized that the fact that we couldn't count on our students having any particular chemicals at home wasn't actually a flaw. It was actually a benefit to us. It was something great because every student could try whatever they had at their house. And then we had students submit their answers um, to a Google Doc, you know, just a very simple Google form. What did you use? How did it turn out? And then students could go through that form later on and try to figure out what, um, you know, what were the common things that had to be in it. And they could go online and find out what's the ingredients of sriracha, what's the ingredients in soy sauce, what are the ingredients in ketchup, and then try to sort out what are the magic ingredients that make the different things work? And so it was a way to take a thing that was actually a disadvantage and turn it into an advantage. And we've been able to do that with lots of different activities. For example, we're doing an activity with rolling balls down an incline. In my physics classroom, I have a very specific incline with a very specific set of carts and a very specific set of ways I want you to do it. And there is no way to do that online. Instead, we said, find something roll it down, measure the amount of time it takes. What do you think we need to know to know more about that? And so students very quickly figured out that they needed to know how far it rolled down, how much it had to be on an incline, what was more about the thing that was being rolled. You couldn't just like put that in. And so suddenly students were actually wanting to write up their lab and I couldn't ever make them write up a lab when I had a grade and detentions in my quiver, but actually giving them less information made them more wanting to do the things that I've always wanted them to do, like write up and be specific about what they're learning. And so we've been discovering that some of the things that we like used to do in class because we couldn't do them that way online, maybe those aren't always the right choices in class either. Maybe if we had given them an assortment of things to roll down the incline, then they would have understood better why you have to be specific about in your lab report about what you're gonna do. All right, we've now had a little bit of time. Let us examine what's happened to our penny. So first we'll take the water And it doesn't look like it's changed much at all. Let's look at the one that was in the vinegar. Here's the control. Maybe 
a little bit shinier. If so, not a lot. Here's the one that was in the vinegar and the salt. Wow, you can see that made quite a difference, yeah? Mm -hmm. And then the grossest one, I don't know why it's gross. I'm happy to eat ketchup, but I don't want to get it on my fingers. For some reason that bothers me. And only the bottom of the penny was in the ketchup. And maybe you can see. Uh, you see it off in the corner? Only the part that was in the ketchup became clean. There we go. You see that little bright spot in the middle there? That was the part part that was in the ketchup. Melissa, has yours soaked in the sriracha long enough? Yeah, this is somewhat of a miracle actually. Um, can you guys see it? Wow. Yeah, it was a pretty dingy penny. And I put actually two of them in there. So. So there you go. So that's a little activity. You can go in when you, if all of you all were looking around, you can try to sort out what are the separate ingredients. Anyone have any guesses as to what the magic ingredients are? Kind of acid. So some kind of acid, although the acid, did the, the acid alone work? You know, like if we had a strong enough acid, it would work. Good thinking there. Yeah. Um, so an acid matters. It's hard to believe. It's surprising perhaps for many people to think that ketchup has a relatively low pH. What else? So, oh, so salt and so, so salt and vinegar. So salt seems to matter. Yeah. Mystery science with Doug. I don't know mystery science with Doug. So you could try the difference. You can make your own by making, squeezing some lemon. One of your students will want to do this as an experiment. They'll have lemon and then you can squeeze that and see if that works better or worse than the vinegar. The copper and the chlorine from the salt. Uh, so the copper and the, so it's all in solution. So it doesn't really bind up in that kind of way. Um, the copper oxide um, and copper nitrides and copper sulfates are what mostly what's on the outside of the penny. Um, and the chlorine breaks up the oxide layer and lets the vinegar do its work, dirty work underneath. If you took a piece of uh, steel wool and scratched it up, then you could make the same thing happen. And that's why, and anyone who lives, we, I, I live near the ocean, you all live near the ocean. We think of salt water as being so corrosive. It turns out it's not the sodium in salt water that's so corrosive, it's the chlorine that does all the dirty work for it. Um, in this case, it does the cleaning work as well. So chlorine bleach, um, that chlorine's not there for show. All right, questions about how you might do this as an activity. Like I said, we have online, we have a lot more explanation about why it works and different ways to think about how to do it with students. And again, having students try lots of different things. And there's lots to be done here. Like you could say to yourself, do you think soap and water works? Soap and water gets lots of things clean. Will bleach get it clean? Like you can give your students the chance to try lots and lots of things. Will baking soda get it clean? That's the second thing. If it's not vinegar, I'm told I should use baking soda to clean everything in my house. All right. Are we ready for something? Are we ready to try something else? How many people brought a piece of string with them?
All right. This is not related to chemistry. This is a physics activity. Um, for a while, I dated an, a uh, kindergarten teacher, and she used to say this was the single best activity I ever showed her. And I'll let you all try to guess afterwards why you think, why she thought this was the single best activity she had ever seen. So what you're going to want to do is you're going to just take this uh, string, you're going to put it behind your head. And then you're just going to pull it forward like this. And you can wrap the ends around your finger. I notice people turning off their camera. They're like, I'm going to look silly. Yes, you are. It's okay, we're teachers. You ever tried out all the mirrors at Walgreens to decide which one was the good magnifying mirror that you needed for your class and you set them all on the floor and did strange gestures towards them to figure out their focal lengths? Well, <laughs> that's your future. All right, so if you pull the string a little moderately tight and you pluck the string, And you can pull the string to different tightnesses. You can pull it really hard. You let it loose. You can put it over your ear so it's touching your penna, the outside part of your ear. And not on the other side to see if it sounds the same. So someone who's trying this out, do you want to give us a report about what you're hearing? If anything. The, um, the string is like twanging, but if you, you can twang it, it, you can, yeah, uh-huh. But if you pull it tighter, it gets higher and looser is lower. Yeah. Other people see, I see a couple of thumbs up, people agreeing with this. Fantastic. Here's the, so, and then you can make the ring, string different lengths as well. You can grab it closer to you and make the string shorter and then pull it till it hurts your ears the same amount. And see if that's the same pitch. So lower pitch further away. So lower pitch when it's further away. It gets higher when it gets closer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you've got strings that are different lengths, you can try that as well. A shoelace works perfectly fine too. So uh, has anyone guessed why... Um, my friend, the, the kindergarten teacher, thought that this was the best sound activity she'd ever done with her students ever. You all are a tough crowd, but I'm going to go with only her students could hear it. Right. None of us, even if I put the microphone right, even if I get the microphone right next to it, you can't hear it. Yeah. If you wrap the string around the microphone, well, that works. So that tells you something about the nature of how the vibrations of of the string get into the air. We call this we call this activity head harp because it's great because it's only in your head, but it helps students learn 
how to express what they're feeling because they can't tell you any other way. There's no way for them to let you know about what's going on except by having to explain it and build up a vocabulary to try to explain what they are uniquely experiencing. And that is actually one of the really powerful K-5 science and English language arts standards is having students be able to convey evidence to you. And when, they can, when everyone can see the same thing, students are sort of like, I don't know why I would need to do that. You can see it and hear it just as well as I can. But when it's their own unique experience, then they feel compelled. It like creates the right motivation to help them learn how to tell you what they um, are feeling and sensing. The, um, the great thing of, also about head harp is that it really helps students understand what the purpose of all that other stuff that you get with a guitar. You got that thin box that comes with the guitar. You got that little um, plastic piece that if you take it out, the guitar doesn't work at all, at all. That little white thing that's usually in a guitar and how an electric guitar is different than an acoustic guitar um, because you can get a sense of this thing of the sounding boards for it. And when it's okay for kids to touch each other again, you can have them put their ear on the head of another student and they can hear the vibrations through the head of the other kid. If that's ever allowed again, it's freaking fantastic when they can get it. So that would be like the way you might start a sound unit. You can see the vibrations in the string. You can hear them. You have to develop vocabulary to explain it with other students. Uh, and other people. And then you might move on to an activity we call secret bells. That's when you just take the string and sort of tie a knot perhaps. Wow, that is exceptionally loud. My phone's really loud when it's vibrating right now. It isn't usually, but maybe it's because it's sitting on my kitchen table, which is really loud. Anyway, you take this, you make like a, this is like just a spatula. You just put a loop in it and tie it on. And then you take the ends of it and you stick them in your ear. And then you hit it against something. And then inside my ear, I can hear, wow, it sounds like Big Ben. It sounds like church bells. And again, we can get into something about different things vibrating. You can pick different size objects. Um, a coat hanger works fantastic a metal spoon, all sorts of things. And that once again, it's all in their head. So they have to relay the information back to you. And again, that gives a really good opportunity to get more, more out of it for our students. We have dozens of other activities, including one of my favorites, which is palm pipes which is a nice online activity if you have a way to get stuff to your students. See if you can hear it in my microphone. Can you hear that? So you can give the students different length pieces of PVC. You can outfit an entire orchestra for your students for less than $5. Actually, it should cost you $20 because buy the $15 PVC cutter. That thing is the most glorious device ever made. Lots of people are smiling here. I think you all know about it. They're fantastic. They're good for, by the way, cutting other things besides BBC. The cut pencil's fantastic too. If you need to, you know, need little pencils for your class, pop them out. And you can have the students play a song. Exactly, they're like cheaper boom whackers, someone says. They actually work slightly different than boom whackers do, but yes, they're great. And by the way, if you need to make your own custom boom whackers, they're not much cheaper if you do this, but if you wanna make your own custom pitches out of boom whackers, 
they sell at the hardware store covers for fluorescent lights. So California has a law that says that if you're a commercial establishment, that you have to put this plastic cover over your fluorescent bulbs in case they crack so that they don't rain glass down on your customers. I think it's probably a good idea, but they're required. And so when you go to the when you go to the hardware store in the section that they sell fluorescent bulbs, they sell giant long plastic. I'm, I'm doing my hands like you can see it that way, but they're like they're ones that they're four and eight foot long plastic tubes. And you can just take scissors and cut them to whatever length you want. And then you can whack people in the head with them just like boom whackers and work exactly like boom whackers. Except they're not different colors and they're clear. I think that clear part's pretty cool. Anyway, it lets you like make different pitches. So boom whackers are tuned to a particular set of pitches on the chromatic scale. But if you'd like to have different ones, like you'd like to have the sharps and flats, then you can cut your own ones out of that pipe for next to nothing. Boom whackers aren't that expensive anyway, but you can make your own, you can make your own additional ones. And what's super interesting about that is that some students think that it's the plastic that makes the sound on the boom whackers and not the air inside the plastic. So if you cut other ones that are the same length, they make the same pitch, but they're clearly made of different plastic, which helps students understand that it's the length that matters, not the material that it's made out of. Which is true of trumpets as well. A trumpet made of plastic will sound just the same. It's ugly, but it works. Like I said, we have dozens of sound activities on our website, and I'll give you a link to all of that and at the end so that you can go find them. But I think we have maybe 25 sound activities, all at a variety of levels, and all with usually information about how to move it to different levels as well. All right, I'm getting some head nods, which is hopefully telling me that it's good to go on to the next part. So I'm going to direct you to this mirror that I have behind me. So for a moment, I'm going to talk to you from Mirrorland. Mirrorland's an interesting place. It's just like regular land, except if I hold up my left hand, mirror me holds up my... Well, it's a little bit complicated trying to figure out exactly what mirror me is doing. Mirror me is holding up... Well, it's holding up a hand. It's definitely holding up one hand. It's hard to decide if mirror me is holding up its left hand or its right hand. It's holding up its right hand, but my... It's, on, it's the hand that's on my left side. Yeah? yeah? Is that what it's doing? It's a little bit tough to figure out. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to dispense with this left and right for a moment because that's very confusing. And before we go on, on I want you to write down why you think, or I want you to write down in the chat, why you think mirror me is different than me. Don't press return. Just type what you think it is in the chat and I'll have everyone plus press return at the same time. Because if you, if you all really understand this, we can move on to something else. But I think that this might be, I think there might be something subtle here. And so I'd love to hear what you all think about this first. So what do you, what do you notice? What do you wonder about how mirror Zeke is different than real Zeke? Does anyone need more time to type some stuff in? All 
All right, well, if you're willing to put your information in the chat, you could just send it directly to me if you want, but if you're willing to let everyone see it, because I didn't pick this activity because I thought 100% of you all would already know it. I picked this activity because I thought many of you all might not know this because I only learned it a couple of weeks ago. So if you all would like to press enter in the chat so I can sort of see what you might be thinking on this topic. We have lots of those are the just, you know, they're the opposites there. All right, so let's, so let's try to figure out more specifically what's going on here. Um, and if you want to turn on your microphones and shout at me, that's great because uh, it's hard to look at you and see the chat at the same time, but we can make this work. So I'm going, instead of using left and right, because mirror Zeke, left and right is reversed, which is weird. Like, why is his left and right reversed, but not as up and down? Why is not up and down reversed? Is it because we have two eyes and they're horizontal? If we turned our head like this, would it be reversed up and down? Hmm. You're like, I've looked in a mirror every morning and I have never <laughs> tried that. <laughs> Yeah, sorry about that. If you close one eye, does it stop being reversed? No, so it's probably not something to do with your two eyes. Although the last time I taught kids, which was a few years ago, uh, more than 50% were convinced that it was the two eyes thing. Someone said it, is it because the glass isn't curved? It's flat. The, yes, this glass is flat. This is a, a, a glass that is usually on the wall of my bathroom, which is not currently on the wall of my bathroom. Your my wife's a science teacher. She understands this. Aren't all images upside down and your brain flips them right side up? That's certainly true. Um, and they're both upside down and backwards on your retina and your brain you learn as a baby to flip it back the other way, or at least be okay with it that way. By the way, we have glasses at the Exploratorium that if you wear them, that will flip your vision, it'll move your vision. So everything's about this much, about 30 degrees off from where it should be. And if you wear them, it's really hard to like throw and play catch with them. But did you know that after about half an hour, it's, it feels sort of like you're back to normal again. And then when I you take them off, it's hard to throw and catch. Your brain is so drunk plastic. Huh? They, call, they call them drunk goggles. And you can actually teach a kid how quickly your brain adapts to new input. And it literally takes three tries of something like throw a bean bag at a target and then put the drunk goggles on and throw the bean bag at the target again um, three times. And your brain has already adapted. Your brain has built a synapse that quickly and then you take them off and you try to do it and your brain is adapted to that other one that quickly. So I, I totally agree, it's really amazing. But I have a question, what age students were you doing it with? I did this at a brain seminar in a conference. I didn't do it with kids. All right, so it's super cool if you get a chance to do it with kids. The glasses are kind of pricey, but they're not terrible. But the thing I wanted to say though is, is that if, you're, if the student who's trying to relearn it is that's like the sport that they play. Like if you have like one of the, like a person who's a softball pitcher who's trying to toss a beanbag, they cannot relearn it. It'll take them weeks and weeks and weeks because they've so strongly built those original synapses that they can't undo them. As, like it took a long time to make them and it takes a long time to undo them. And that's why practice doesn't make perfect. Practice makes permanent. The longer you've done something, the longer it takes to undo it. But for you and me, like, well, I don't know, you might be a very talented softball player, but I am not. And so it is super fast for me to learn about reversals and things like that because, you know, I'm a klutz. All right, back to our mirror here. So here's what I'm going to do. Instead of doing left and right with the mirror to investigate it, I'm going to use directions. So... 
it turns out in my house, that direction is east. So I'm gonna put a little sign up that says that direction's east. Can y'all see that E at all? Maybe I, should I uh, spotlight myself? That's clear. Oh, it's clear, great. So real Zeke is going to point east. Which way does mirror Zeke point? East. Mirror Zeke is also pointing east. All right. If I point west, which way is Mirror Zeke hit, trying to hitch a ride? West. 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 So left and right, those might be reversed, but the directions are the same. I point east, Mirror Zeke points east. I point west, Mirror Zeke points west. I point now. Do you think it'll be different for up and down? I point up. Mirror Zeke points up. I point down. Mirror Zeke points down. Mirror Zeke does exactly the same thing that real Zeke does. I don't even understand what this whole thing with um, the mirror reversing stuff. But you're not facing. You're not facing the mirror. Oh, so you're saying there's one more direction left for me. Yeah? <laughs> Backwards. <laughs> I could point into the mirror, right? Well, you're not facing. All right, here, I'll still face the mirror. I'm going to point, I'm pointing west. Which way? Can you see me, oh, me yeah. and Mirror Zeke? Yep. Is Mirror Zeke still pointing to the west? Yes. And east? east. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's not the same um, hand. It's still not the same hand, but it's the same direction. Unless you point at the mirror, right? Because oh, then... so there you go. So we've pointed in four ways, but there's still two more. What are the other two? At the mirror and away from it. At okay. the mirror and away from the mirror. So if I point into the mirror, which way is mirror Zeke pointing? Out. Out, out the from mirror. the mirror. <laughs> and if I point out of the mirror, which way does mirror Zeke point? Oh, wait. <laughs> Into if it, I point I'm confused. That way. <laughs> the other way. The directions, what they really are, north and south. If I point south, mirror Zeke points? North. 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 And if I point north, mirror Zeke points? South. North. South. The thing that gets flipped, it's not left and right. West and east stay totally the same. The thing that gets flipped with a mirror is in and out. If you point into the mirror, then the mirror you points out. And so then you're like, but I don't understand What's up with the whole left hand, right hand? Let's, we'll just be patient just a little bit longer on that. Let me, so the problem is, is that if you're flipping things front to back, the problem is, is that writing also gets flipped to front to back. But do you know what writing looks like from the back side. <laughs> well, I don't usually see writing from the back side. So I made, uh, I, I made a, a letter. So here's the letter F. And I needed it on something that I could see through. So I could see the back side of the letter F. And so what I used, I did this on a Ziploc bag. And so instead of looking at the F from the front side, if I look at the F from the back side, how does that look? Yeah. That looks flipped left to right. If you see letters from the back side of the letter, that's when they look backwards. And so that's, what ha that's what's happening with the mirror. It flips it front to back. And so now you're seeing letters from the wrong side. 
And if you've ever had a t-shirt like my Exploratorium t-shirt right here, and when I pull it up over my head and it's sunny, I do see the letters from the backside and they look backwards. Or if I go to the barber shop and they have writing on the window, and I don't know why barber shops in particular have writing on the window, but the writing on the window looks backwards from the inside because when you're seeing the letters from the inside of the barber shop, you're seeing them from the wrong side. And those letters look flipped left to right. And actually there's a secret. Why do barber shops write things so often backwards on their windows so that you can see through them? Well, it's good to be able to see people in the barber shop, right? That makes you want to go there more, more if you can like look at them and see that they're getting good haircuts. But what else do they have a lot of in barber shops? Mirrors. And so that backwards lettering in the mirror in the barber shop looks the right direction again. And so they can sort of advertise to you some more that way. Yeah, like bumper stickers on the front of people's cars. If you're looking at them through your rear view mirror, they're that's right. So that you see them forwards. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So yeah, so if you just you're just seeing the bumper stickers, they used to sell clear bumper stickers, and they were they had they they had they had the writing ambulance on one side, and then they had adhesive on both sides. The center was transparent. And if they were gonna put it on the front of the ambulance, they pull the one side's adhesive off and stick it on. And if they were putting it on the back side, they put the other side, they pull the other side's adhesive off. Because it just depended on whether or not you're gonna be seeing it through a mirror. And if you're gonna see it through a mirror, you gotta swap it twice. So it looks the front way. Although frankly, I don't think ambulance is that hard a word to recognize backwards, but they do what they do. Now, I've said all that. Are you ready for a challenge? Yes. Great. Okay, so here is my letter. Let me stand over here. Here's my letter F. Now I've been having this, um, this uh, uh, clipboard right behind it so that you can't see through to the mirror. But if I take the clipboard away and you can see the F in the mirror, which way will the F look? Will it look, don't, so I want you to type it into the chat, but don't press return yet. Which way do you think the F will look reversed or normal when I move the clipboard so that you can see it? Some people jump the gun, but a lot of people put normal, 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 normal. All right, are we ready to take a look? Can't see. Right. I'm having trouble with the angles here. Hold it from the bottom of the plastic bag. Go back where you, yeah, there you go. Ah, oh, there we go. Yeah, there you go. And how does it look in the mirror? Normal. Normal. Looks normal. Okay. And it does look backwards to mirror Zeke. So it looks normal to us in the mirror because the mirror is seeing the backside of the F and so the mirror changes back to front. So then it's looking front ways again. And um, again, we have this as an activity with all the things that you need to do and how to tell the story of it. But I've always loved this activity because every day, essentially every one of us, well, there are a few, I'm from New Orleans, so I do understand that there are a few vampires out there and I don't wanna be upset you know, with them but all the rest of us see our image in the mirror every morning. We get so used to it. And yet sometimes we don't understand how it works. And I find that so interesting that there are these things that we see all the time, but we aren't always on top of um, how it might work. Does anyone have any questions?
And by the way, you don't have to move your mirror into your room. You can take your computer or your camera into the bathroom and do this. I just only have, we have a lot of people in our house and I'm not allowed to tie up the bathroom that long, but maybe you can get away with it in your place. Great. I have a couple more things to sh that I think you might be interested in seeing. Um, here we go. So I usually have students do this activity with uh, scotch tape, but I'm going to do it with big um, tape because it's easier for you to see on camera. Is that okay? okay but you don't have to use packing tape. If you have scotch tape at home, what you just want to do is make a little little tab on the top so it has a little handle. So I've got these two pieces. And I'm going to stack them together so that they make a little sandwich. But I'm not putting adhesive side to adhesive side. I'm putting the sticky side to the non-sticky side. If you put the two sticky sides together, you'll never get them apart again. And then I'm just going to write. Uh, a T on the top one. So I'll remember which one's the top one later. I've got this little sandwich. And then if I pull them apart quickly, and bring them back close to each other. Can you, you don't see what's happening? I'll do it sideways. Is it, is it static? It is, they jump towards each other from static electricity. The top side loses electrons to the bottom side. The bottom side becomes positive and the top side becomes, um, I said that backwards. The bottom, top side becomes positive and the bottom side becomes negative. The top one loses electrons to the bottom one. And so that's kind of cool, but you're like, huh, it's not that exciting. I've, uh, I've, you know, charged up a balloon by rubbing it against my hair. That's not super, that's not super interesting. I hear where you're going with that. If you make another sandwich, same thing again. And I'll mark both of the, I'll mark this one with a T as well. Then I'll pull apart 
our new sandwich. Got a T here. And I'm going to pull apart the other one. So I guess set the T down for just a second. I'm just touching it a little. And now, it was easier just a moment ago. I just finished my magnet unit. This is so fun. And you can see the two T's repel each other. Oh, yeah. And it is storming outside here in San Francisco. It is raining cats and dogs and it's warm too. So I don't have any, this is also my basement. So I don't actually have any heat on and it still works. No static electricity things work when it's raining, but this still does. The two bottoms would also repel each other, um, but I accidentally dropped one. <laughs> And so you can make really good static charges with scotch tape. The Magic brand works the best. Others sometimes work. The shiny ones usually don't work. I don't know why. Um, on packing tape, if it's wimpy packing tape, it usually works. If it's the super strong kind, it doesn't work. So cheaper packing tape, but you want it to be relatively thick um, as well. And you can use the tape to find the electrical charge, the sign of the charge and other things. So like you can rub a balloon against your hair and then you can put the tape near your hair and see if it's attracted or repelled from your hair. And you can put it next to uh, the balloon and see if it's attracted or repelled from the balloon. You can figure out the sign. You can create a sign convention. It's not the one that Franklin used. They didn't have magic tape then, but it's the one you can use in your classroom to make the sign convention for it and figure it and try all the other stuff out. Does anyone else have a favorite static electricity thing? We're writing new static electricity activities right now at the Exploratorium. If y'all have any great ideas, I'd love to hear them from you. Do you do the water in the comb? Like the comb on fur and then put it near running water and it'll bend? You know, we do do that one, but I'm not entirely convinced I understand why it bends. It works though. It does, it definitely does. I just don't, I'm not entirely convinced, sure why it well, does. Well, do you think it's because the molecules of water are, are polar? Yeah, but the difference between the, 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 the dipole for, hey Mark, good to see you. Uh, the Thank dipole, you. So short on water, it's hard to imagine like yeah. the difference. It's like it bends an awful lot. Yeah. And tissue paper also works really well too. Um, you know, thin, really thin tissue paper. If you use the comb on your hair, the it looks like I've been using the comb on my hair all day, but or haven't been, but um, you know, on the tissue paper that works too. We, we did a lot of stuff with that. I'll have to look some stuff up so you can get back to you. I'm a little rusty too, because I haven't been in the classroom for a couple of years. Now, the, one, the activity we're working on here, I'll show you all the prototype for it. So it's one of these tiny, elect, tiny electronic scales. Are you all familiar with these? These, these measure to the hundredth of a gram and they cost $12. Oh, cool. Amazon's best. Just pick whatever one looks cheap. And then, here I can do it on this camera. So then we put a, a piece of paper 
and a coin on the top. And I don't know if you can read the screen on it very well. I'll spotlight that one. Let's see if that helps. So I think you can sort of read the screen there maybe. So I'm gonna rub this balloon against my hair and I bring it to the I don't know if you all can see, but the number on the screen just barely changes. Open the computer back just a little so we can see up at the top what you're doing. Oh, okay. Right, yeah, a little bit more. Because we can see the scale, just can't see what you're doing. Oh, great, thank you. Is that better? Yes, yeah. thank you. So then I'm just bringing this balloon close to the coin. Mm. And I can make the coin change its reading just a little bit when I get it close, but not touching. It's hard to get it close without touching in, but it does change it a bit, but I'm not sure, not sure if this is ready for prime time or not yet. <laughs> but I am, I bring this up though, this, this activity here, because this is gonna take a bunch more work to make sure that it actually works, works reliably. Now we had been doing it on dry days and now we're trying to do it on, on wet days, which is why I have it out right now because it's been raining. Um, so and, is, is the sorry. premise that the, elect the electrons are jumping from the balloon to the coin or? So, so uh, if I bring the balloon near the coin, the balloon becomes negatively charged. So the electrons will migrate upwards in the coin. And, I'm sorry, will migrate downwards. And so then the positive top of the coin will attract the balloon and the negative side will be repelled, but it's farther away by the thickness of the coin. And so we think there'll be a little bit of attraction. And on a dry day, we get a couple of grams of attraction. And I know grams are uh, not a unit of force. You all don't mind. Um, so we get a little bit of attraction, but on wet days, not as much. And we're not sure exactly what the, like what we, we think it ought to still work, but it doesn't seem to work as well. Um, and so we're working on that. And I'm gonna spend uh, on this project, I'll probably get to spend four or five days total time coming together with an activity. And I know that when I was a teacher, I'd have time maybe to make two or three activities a year that I could devote enough time to make something really reliable and works every time. Um, but I didn't have enough to like make a year's worth of materials. And that's what my job is. And the job of everyone, all 10 people who work in our office is to design activities and then publish them where we're sure that they work and we're sure we know the science of them so that other people can use them and they will work guaranteed for them. And that's what we have. And I, one of my colleagues likes to describe it as having the luxury of time. We have the time to try all those things that you might not ha normally have the time to do. And so, and in our office, half the people who are there are um, high school or middle and high school teachers. And the other half are PhD scientists. And we work together to try to make sure that we all understand everything 
um, and we have something that's useful and reliable for use in the classroom. Alrighty. All right, let's look at a couple more things and then I will um, give you all a chance to ask me questions or point you to resources. Um, for this next one, I'm gonna put a link uh, in the chat. And if you will go to that link, you might recognize the activity. If you can just click on that. Oops, I just sent that to the wrong person. Sorry about that, I should send that to everyone. So if you click on that, if you're using it on, uh, most of you all look like you're reasonable distances away from a computer screen. Um, if you're very far away, this you will have to sort of lean closer, but this is the classic um, blind spot activity. So there's instructions. So there, everyone has um, two slides. So each one of those pictures that you go to has two slides, um, a left eye dominant and a right eye dominant. So I only see out of my left eye. So I always was annoyed when things like this only came designed for one eye. So we designed it for both eyes. So you can pick whichever one on our slide two to give it a try. And it'll give you instructions about which eye to close and you can cover it if that's easier. And then you're gonna move your head back and forth. And you're gonna stare at the cross. So they, so stare at the cross. And for my size screen, it's about 10 inches away. So stare at the cross and move your head in and out. And at some distance away, the dot will vanish. It's about this far back for, mo for most people, for an average size screen. I see some frowny faces from the people who have their cameras on. We've got a few people who've been able to make it vanish. A few, few people with their thumbs up. Does anyone wanna yell at me and say, this thing doesn't work, you made this all up, I don't believe you? So the reason why you have a blind spot is because the human eye is not intelligently designed. The blood supply that goes to your retina, as well as the optic nerve that takes the information away is connected on the front side of the retina, the side where the light hits. That seems like a great plan. Anyway, those nerves have to eventually make it out the backside of your eye and go to your brain. And so there's a spot in your eye where those nerves cross over from the front and go back through the back wall of your eye and then to your brain. There are no optic, there are no neurons in that location because there's this big bundle of nerve fibers there instead. And that means that that place in your eye, you can't see anything. Interestingly enough, it's not a black spot in your vision. Your brain does something totally wackadoo to deal with the fact that there's a spot in your eye that has no vision. 
it makes it go away. Here's some more things that you can do with that. So here's a picture of the setting sun. Close one of your eyes. Close your, if you're using the first frame, close your right eye and then stare at the cross and see if you can move your head to make the sun go away, make the sun set. You don't have to wait to go to the beach. You can make the sunset right now. I think it's amazing that it doesn't just like leave a black spot. It's able to take the surrounding colors, which are a gradient, it's not even a solid color, and fills it in. Your brain fills in that information. It figures it out. All right, what do you wonder? What other experiments would you like me to do? Type stuff in the chat. What would you like to do with this? Anyone not make it work and wants to help? Oh, I, oh, Rachel, I haven't explained why it works. I mean, I know why I've explained why there's a hole in your vision. Um, I'm not sure I know or anyone else does why it works. It works, it's, it's, it's in your brain. Your brain does stuff, which is not really much of an explanation now, is it? Thermal energy always seems like the right answer to, to that's always the right answer in a chemistry problem, but um, I don't know how. Oh, you want more thermal energy activities. Good. Uh, I do have some. I'll, if you can hang on to after we do blind spots, I will give you some examples of some thermal activities to do. Oh, yeah. Here, I'll put my name, info in the chat right now. So I'm ZCOS over at exploratorium.edu. And I'll give you the link to the doc, which has links to all of this stuff. Zeke, if you want to email it to me as well at the end of the presentation, I can share it out with everyone. Oh, great. Um, before you go, of course, I want you to use all of our activities that we have online. Please, please use them. And what I also want to talk to you about is that if you end up teaching in San Francisco or in the East Bay, we don't get as far south as San Jose or Santa Cruz, but we have a, a new teacher program that's not only free, but we pay the new teachers to be part of it. And we'd love for you to suggest people to come to do the Exploratorium program. And I will put the link to that as well. And you'll find links there to uh, more information about it. Um, but we are, we love teachers. We're the Teacher Institute. The teachers are our favorite people in the whole world. All right, let me show you. You know, there are a lot of programs that are focused towards students. We are not, we are focused on teachers. We think that if we do you right, then you'll do students right. 
But a lot of programs, they're all only focused about kids and they'll burn out teachers and they will abuse teachers and tell you you should be abused and that that's okay. We are not that. We love teachers. All right, let me show you another um, uh, thing you can do with uh, blind spots. Right, this one's going to blow your mind. Has anyone been able to make the starburst fill in? I see some people still moving back and forth. It, it's a little bit tricky, a little bit trickier. Hey, Zeke, I am using a second screen and it's farther away. So when you say fill in, what, what do you mean? What should I? So because what, what I'm saying is it looks like pickup sticks that are just like all over the place. Oh, really? Oh, that's yeah. interesting. For me, when I get it in the right spot, when I get that inner circle in the blind spot, then it looks like the rays come all the way to the center to me, that there's no more a hole, that it fills in the okay. spiral. It might do that, but I don't see all of the, all of the rays. Just oh, interesting. So it's like got some of them and not some of them. Right. That's yeah. the same for me, Rhonda. Mine also only filled in like a couple at a time and it kind of looked like they were moving. <laughs> I thought maybe because I had artificial lenses in my eyes. <laughs> would do it. Oh, I do too. I, I have contact lenses on. So maybe it does oh. have to do with that. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I made the hole too big. It may have been better if the hole was a little bit smaller. I thought maybe it was because my screen was farther back, but I'm going to have, I'm going to leave that one on my screen and play around with it later. And in the document I sent you, there is a link to like a whole folder of dozens of different ones. There are ones where there's like a complete pattern, like 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 uh, like um, wrapping paper, and it'll fill in the pattern from the wrapping paper. It's amazing. Your brain doesn't like an empty spot in your vision, and it will fix the empty spot. It Does will. Does one of the four pictures work better than others? Because the, oh. the, the two on the bottom have a bigger center hole than the two on the top. Right. So for most people, they, the two on the bottom are too big. Their brain won't fill it in. But the ones on the top, they will. So it's sort of a, get a sense of how big your blind spot is. And we have an activity that's very much measuring that. And in that tiny URL, you can find a link to all the different ones we've made with my students after we would do, we would do this as a beginning of the year activity. So I teach physics and environmental science. I don't teach you, I never taught human perception, but we'd still do this at the beginning of the year. Why? 
because this is an activity where people are, all they have to be is honest. They can't be wrong about their answers. If they say they can't see it, as long as they're honest, they can't see it. If they can see it, great. And then they can have lots of questions about, yay, you got it. And then they can have lots of questions. What would happen if it was different colors? What would happen if the hole was bigger? What would happen if it was shaped like a giraffe? Like, what can you do? And you can try out lots and lots of different activities. Everyone can try them out on their own. And these things are just Google Slides. You can copy it to your own and make whatever you want. You all are really good people here. When the last group I was with, they stopped paying attention to me after slide one and kept drawing all their own ones to see what would happen with them, including one person who when you like put the, they used words and when you put the words in it, it went from being a school appropriate phrase to a school inappropriate phrase with it. So like there's so much to be done um, with this kind of activity and it helps students, especially when we were in an online environment, helps them have the opportunity to try phenomena, try experiences, be honest with their answers of what they see back with me so that we can uh, learn to become a, a community that can trust each other and trust each other's results. All righty. So Zeke, Melody you, asked, sorry. No, I'm sorry. I, I, I was gonna ask if you, are you using a document camera to project or are you able to get this um, level of clarity with your regular um, computer camera? Oh yeah, so this is the document camera on my computer. And then the other one is my phone. The, the one that's the scale is my phone. It's just, I just had both of them call into the, you know, go, go into the Zoom meeting. Um, this uh, computer actually does have quite a nice um, camera on it, which is why I'm using this computer. Um, uh, but there are bunches of document cameras you can buy. Uh, they don't, a lot of them don't work terribly well with Macs, but if you have a PC, most of them work pretty, pretty great. And they're, they've gotten cheap again. They were very expensive for a while, but now they're back down to 25 or $30. It'll get you an HD camera. Um, but I'm using a, the Exploratorium has us use Macs and none of the document cameras will work with the Mac. So that's why my phone is just calling into the meeting. Thanks. Sure. Melody asked about some uh, temperature, thermal energy sorts of things. Can you tell me what grade level? Uh, sixth grade. Sixth grade. So mostly trying to get a sense for things that might feel like they're different temperatures might be actually the same temperature and maybe like some things can ab absorb heat faster than others. Is that the sort of things that you're looking for? Um, yeah, so, um, you know, I have them touch plastic and metal and they all think the metal's colder. Um, and we talk about that. But um, I, I think... Um, do you melt ice so cubes? I, yeah, I was going to do that next on melting ice cubes on different surfaces. We did an insulation activity where I just had them try to prevent a little plastic bag person from freezing in the freezer for as long as possible. And um, uh, so I'm using a simulation through Amplify. Sure, one and, of my colleagues used to work for them. And it's it's pretty good, but it's it's dry. <laughs> so I wanted something that's a little more engaging. Um, yeah, so any ideas? So I will, so I'll definitely encourage you to do the um, melting the ice cube on different surfaces and have them place bets about which surfaces they think will work the best. Uh, and I would encourage them to like the night before, uh, you know, do things that they are likely to have in their house. You may not be able to have them. Are you online or in person? Online. Online. So I might not have them, each student try to do it because maybe coming up with ice cubes is tough for, tough for your students. But I would have them like feel a piece of wood or wall and feel a, a frying pan and feel some different things. And then decide how they want to bet from that. 
And then I put the ice cubes in and have them like, like this race. And you might consider um, doing, doing it ahead of time with a time, using a time-lapse app for your phone. So if you have an Android phone, there are a whole bunch of time-lapse apps. They all work great. You can run, let them run overnight. And then you can make a little video that you can show. You can upload it to YouTube or to Google Docs or something like that. And then you can show the ice cube melting. You can also do it in person. If you have an aluminum pan, it will melt as you watch, as you almost surely already know. Um, but I think that that, work, that works really great. But the key I've discovered with students is like making them be committed to it, like a bet ahead of time. Like it doesn't even have to be for anything, but they just like committed themselves to it. And they will like root on theirs and be just despondent when they don't win. Um, it, it works great. Thank you. Yeah, I had the idea of melting on different surfaces, but um, really the engagement part would be getting them invested in it in the beginning by betting. So thank you. Sure. <laughs> Didn't even occur to me. <laughs> and you also might find um, if you have like a pair of thermos mugs um, or a mug and a glass or something like that, the fact that a mug both makes it slower for things to warm up and slower to cool down really helps students get their head around the fact that it's just the motion of heat and it moves either in or out, but it's symmetric. So my students were always like, so they didn't drink that much coffee. So I like always think of thermoses as keeping things warm, but my students would drink cold things. And so they think of thermoses as keeping things cold and having that competition that the both ways, like it keeps things warm longer, it keeps things cold longer. That's something about going through the wall. Um, that my students always found that a very enlightening thing. And once again, we place bets on it. And then my last thing is just a story. So I know I work for the Exploratorium. We're all about activities. We're not about stories. But every so often, there's a story that will really win the day. And this came from when I was teaching in New Orleans, which had a strange cold snap one year. And the football team, when they got done, um, their sodas had, uh, their Gatorades had frozen on the bus. So they get on the bus, their Gatorade is frozen. Most of the kids, their first idea was to put it underneath their coat and warm up the Gatorade so it would melt. But one kid took his coat off and wrapped it around the Gatorade because he's like, the coat keeps me warm, it'll keep the Gatorade warm too. And your smile and students' smiles when they hear that story are really sort of an enlightening moment about what's really happening, like what do coats really do? <laughs> All right. Anyone else have some activities they'd like to be directed towards? But and we also have other activities, um, black and uh, uh, silver and black cans and things like that. We have some other activities online that go with it. Um, I have a question. Um, sure. I was wondering if you know of any like natural history or environmental science type of focused activities specifically um, surrounded around mushrooms. I'm starting to try to put together a lesson plan about like um, mycology. Okay, so I'll start with do you do you have David Aurora's book or Paul Stamets's book? Um, I don't. I recently bought a couple of like identification texts just for like around UCSC mushrooms, and I think they were um, Christian Schwartz's books, but I haven't heard of the other two. Those are fine. Um, let me put so the one, and you can get them from the library. They've been out for forever, so they're in the library. Um, so Paul Stamets and I get his. So he has a book called Everything That the Rain Promises. And it's um, about mushrooms and it's countrywide, but it's sort of focused on the, it's, he's from the Bay Area, so it's focused here. By the way, does anyone watch CBS's Star Trek Discovery? Fine, don't be into science fiction, whatever. Anyway, they, they have this, one of the characters is named after Paul Stamets because he's such a famous mushroom guy. Anyway. Um, uh, his book's great. Then um, we email me because a colleague and I did an entire workshop on 
mushrooms and growing mushrooms yourself. So if you get one of those mushroom logs, those are fantastic. And you can take a picture of it, you know, once an hour when it starts, starts fruiting, you can take a picture of it once an hour and just like see it going crazy. You can weigh it and see how they change. They are fantastic. And I will try to, um, the Exploratorium has a video of it. I can't remember where it is yeah. of the time lapse of them growing. Um, yeah, I'd love to like email you and talk to you about it more. Um, I, I'm trying to put together something for like the sustainability minor. And we normally take on like a, a project and my project is to create these like at home kits filled with lesson plans. Um, but yes, that would be really awesome. So I'll, I'll definitely contact you. Sure. Great. Um, someone tech, uh, sent me a private chat, potential and kinetic energy. Um, so there are, of course, all the, the, the skateboarding activity from FET is great. If you're not familiar with them, yeah, they have a, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I got that. I, we use that. That's right. definite. Um, we've done a lot of stuff with, um, so it depends on how safety conscious you all are, <laughs> your, your place is. We had a lot of luck with making a long string of, so on the safer side, making a long string of rubber bands. So, you know, you can loop the rubber bands together to make like a little rubber band rope mm -hmm. and then attaching that to a water bottle and then letting, pulling it down and letting the water bottle bob up and down. You know what I'm talking about? Yep. Okay. Um, they're not Hooke's Law Springs, but they do go a fairly long time. And it's a good way of all, you got three kinds of energy there. You have kinetic energy, you have gravitational energy and you have uh, elastic energy. And the bouncing is pretty neat because it never goes more than it, you pulled it down. Like you can pull it down a lot. It's never going to pop up more than it goes three, down. right? Sorry? It returns about 0.83% of the way. You know, it depends on the rubber band. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but that's great. You can make pendulums pretty easily as well. Most phones, so I'm sorry, what grade level? Eighth grade. Eighth grade. So most of the phone, if you if you do velocity, um, most phones can video, and you can then uh, send it back frame by frame. And if you make like a pendulum swinging down, you can video that, have it go back frame by frame, and you can figure out the velocity at the bottom, and then compare it to what if you. I don't know if you all do the kinetic energy formulas, but you can at least see that it's going like the bigger angle that you release it from, it's going faster at the bottom. Do the um, kids that, know how to do this frame by frame thing with their phones? Uh, they probably will. Um, okay. So if they, I if they, <laughs> if they, so, so I know, so every phone app runs it a little bit differently, but if they upload it to either Google docs or to um, YouTube and eighth graders are, just at the age where they're actually allowed to do that. So hooray for you. Um, if they upload them, then when they start playing the video back, if they press, and I'm gonna write it in the chat. So you press pause. Mm -hmm. So you pause the video. And then you press comma and period to go one frame forward and one frame backwards. Pause, comma, period. And the mnemonic for remembering that is that if you look at your keyboard, comma and period are right underneath the greater than, less than sign, so they're little arrows. Oh, okay. So if you upload the video to uh, YouTube or, or in Google Docs, it doesn't matter which, then you can go one frame forward and one frame backwards. And most videos you upload will be 30 frames a second. So it's 1 30th of a second. If they use the slow-mo mode on their camera, then it's whatever it is. So my slow-mo mode on my camera is 1 8th the usual speed. So it's 1 240th of a frame each time I go one frame forwards and backwards. Okay. Um, and this is like, this is a super useful thing for it. Um, and you can really get some really, really quite precise stuff with it. And you can really 
get the speeds really quite close to the formula if they're determined to do it. Cool. Thank you. All right, Jessica's putting up the survey form, which probably means I'm supposed to shut up, but you have my email address. Happy to talk to you. Love to get you or your friends in our new teacher program and or to some workshops that we have at the Exploratorium. We'd love to have you be come join us and please at least see the stuff online. You already paid for it through your taxes, so you should definitely get it. Is it, is it just at exploratorium. Um, whatever you put in before exploratorium. Oh, the activities. Well, if you go to the, the tiny URL, I'll put yeah, that. Yeah, I got that. Here. It's in there. Uh, yeah, but here I'll, I'll write it. I'll put where the, all the activities are all located together. Yeah, while well, he's typing that in, um, I just added the chat. One of it is a survey. So if you want to give us some feedback about not only what you liked about today, but also how, let us know what you want to see in the future. Um, the second link is the link for our CalTeach um, webinar. So there you can find register for our next webinar coming up in March or um, see past webinars. We record all of them. The recording of this one will be available next Tuesday. So I'll be emailing everyone. Zeke, if you want to send me any links you want me to share out with everyone, I can include that in that email. Sure, that'd be great. The second link is also the survey form, actually. All right, give me a second. There we go. So that's the second link. That's the website. And the webinar we have coming up in March is Field um, Inquiry in the Virtual Classroom, Incorporating the Outdoors in Your Remote Learning Environment. So kind of touching on uh, some things that I heard someone ask about. We also might have one in between on Gather Town, um, but we have we haven't formally put that one together yet. But it may be, be it may be before the um, field inquiry one. So we're just kind of getting that one together. I don't know if anybody's used Gather Town, but it's kind of a cool. Um, way to like have a classroom and have people moving around in the virtual classroom in different rooms doing activities as well. Oh, that seems cool. Mm -hmm. We tried a few at the Expo High Fidelity. It never really worked well enough. And there was another one that got a lot of press recently and it was a little unreliable, but I'm looking forward to trying more of those. Yeah, Gather Town's free, so we always, I like to try the free ones for, but. Cool. Thank you, Zeke. Thank you. It's great, great, great being here and good seeing you all again. Good seeing you too. And uh, look forward to seeing you at the Exploratorium whenever we open back up again. All right, well, good night, everyone. Bye, thank you. Bye.